Alrighty. Uh, hi there, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Dudley from Kill Protocol. Uh, I'm the developer relations there, and I have my colleague with me. Hi, I'm Avi. I'm uh, one of the core devs of Kill Protocol, and I I'm mainly working on the um, blockchain side of things. Uh, and I'm the assistant presenter today. Yeah, so just a bit, of, a bit of feedback, like talking to each other and discussing a little bit of what uh, Kilt does and go over that. So yeah, the conversation uh, is today is building an attestation service for digital assets. Um, so yeah, um, this is just a content page. Yep, all right. First off, a little bit of history. Uh, why, um, what does Kilt do? And um, why we chose to use Substrate uh, as a framework. So. Maybe to start it off, uh, there's three main reasons for this. Uh, first off, we wanted to offload some of the blockchain-specific uh, logic from in the form of pallets. So again, this is like transactions, consensus, and other things. So we didn't need to do all of that. Substrate uh, had this all uh, ready for us. And then the other time was uh, having our own runtime upgrades. I think this is one of the most important steps, right? So allows us to upgrade or uh, change our code uh, without having to fork or hard fork the, the chain itself. And the third reason is basically having our own customizable, uh, customizable logic, right? And so maybe uh, what do we do at, what actually do we do? Yes, um, so we actually do two main things on our chain, which is um, credentials and DIDs. This is the main core functionality of Kilt. Um, so the DIDs are identifiers that can identify not only persons or entities like companies, but actually anything that you you know want to identify, like NFTs, smart contracts, anything you can think of, basically. And um, you know. Identifying things on its own is nice, but um, you rather want also to attach information to those things, right? I, you know, you know my name, but it was also be nice to know when I'm born that I work actually at Kilt and not only be pretend to work at Kilt and got the T-shirt somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the second thing is credentials, and you know, together with the identifier and the credential, you actually get the digital identity from, for example, from myself or from other things. And that's um, what our core functionality is. Yeah, and so it allows people to have a digital identity and allows them, the users to take control of that. So yeah, um, we've been talking about uh, DIDs or decentralized identifiers. Um, so let me just go over exactly what they are um, and what specifications we use and what standards uh, we're actually um, using. So. Again, um, we're not just uh, taking anything, but we're taking some um, core standards from W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. And this allows us to have a, an on-chain de, uh, decentralized identifier, which uh, basically generates this unique um, DID you can see here. Uh, this is our prefix. It says did killed. And then you can see this um, uh, account address at the end of it. And this allows us to do like uh, a lookup. So you can see here on the right, we have like this uh, lookup, and this is actually what the DID document is. And um, and underneath, you can see my uh, Web3 name, which is basically a unique uh, human readable uh, solution that we build on top of it. Allows for a bit more user uh, readability or human readability. Um, it's called the counselor because I am part of the Kilt Council. Just so you're aware, I'm not uh, just ego pumping myself, but yeah. So, um, so we have some unique features of uh, the DID. Can can you maybe yeah a few things that you, about the document? Uh, like this document basically gives you a lot of information about the DID. You know, it's not you know you have the identifier which can be used to resolve this document, and then you get like rich information about you know who is actually this DID, like um, you know verification methods, how to actually um, verify signatures of the, this entity. So the DID can sign documents and everything, and um, the key management. Um, private uh, the public keys can be found in this document. But you also find other things like service endpoints where you can actually reach this entity, yeah. um, where you can send uh, messages to, for example, or find out in general more about this DID. Like for example, here Dudley. Um, published a credential that actually proves that he owns um, a specific email address. So if you want to write him an email, you could just um, look up his email credential and uh, look up the email. Like the email is inside there, and you can yeah. send him an email. But there are also like, many more use cases. Yeah. And I guess we'll go over some of them now. And um, one of those things is uh, we're just talking a bit 
about why we went in this direction of um, holding a DID versus having an account. So um, maybe uh, just an overview what an account is, what we mean by that, and then versus what a DID is, uh, Albie. Yes, so um, you all probably know accounts on Substrate. Accounts are the things that hold balances. You know you um, all probably also have an account on other blockchains. Um, you can vote on your uh, on, on our chain with the account because it you won't visit, vote with the balance, you can participate in staking and all those things. Uh, but they are not really a fit for identifying you in our um, opinion since they actually, you know, they are like a bank account. You hold yeah. your balance there and you don't want to introduce yourself as um, your bank account. Also, key rotation is kind of tricky there. You could do some things like a proxy, but they're rather built on top and not built like a first class citizen there. So um, there's this one solution for holding your balance, which is the account. You know, it's used for paying fees and voting and staking. But then there's your DAD, which kind of is a layer on top of that. And that holds your credentials. You can rotate keys there. The identifier is not coupled with a private key. So you could always update your private keys, which greatly improves the security, if you want to you know, update your keys uh, regularly or you suspect that a key might be compromised, you can just simply rotate the key. You can have multiple keys for multiple use cases so that they yeah. are um, less um, powerful keys that can only do certain things. Like for example, updating your keys can only be done with a specific key and other keys could only be used for attesting things or sending messages encrypted. And also, you can actually link DADs to an account that might be useful if you want to, you know, as Dudley is a council member, his council address is still an account. Yes. So um, this account should actually have an identity because you want to know who is part of the council. So you can link your account in the use cases where you want to link it. You can link it to your DID and get like all this rich information about an account. And you can also add multiple accounts to one DID, which is also nice because you know if you have multiple accounts, you would need yeah. to build up your identity all over again once, yeah. you know. And um, with the DID, you have one identity, you can link all the accounts you want. Yeah, and I think one, oh, sorry, I thought someone was speaking. Um, yeah, um, so this is why we think of it as more of a fatter identity solution. And this is why we kind of uh, separated the two from each other. And I think it's, um, it's a nice uh, solution at this p point, yeah. So yeah, so maybe just go over a little bit about what the uh, workflow is. Um, so to, we'll just go over the most simplest uh, workflow Kilt does. So just give you an idea of how like the DID and the credentials interact a little bit. So um, we do have like three actors in this scenario. So we have the claimer, the attester, and the verifier. Um, each of them have their own specific role. Um, so usually the claimer is the one that wants to have some form of uh, credential attributed to them. So this uh, individual wants to say that he's over 18 or they're over 18. And so what they do is they go to a provider of this credential. And in this case, this is an attester. So they first uh, approach the attester and then they ask for some form of credential. And that's proving that they're over 18. And what they do is they supplement them with a credential uh, or a claim, and then that attester does work. Uh, this work is done off-chain and done in a manner which the attester has uh, chosen and proves or basically valid validates if this information is correct, and then if it is, they form a transaction. So um, we're going to go over a little bit of what each of these do, sort of the attestation, the did, and the seed type. So basically all of these things um, combined can pretty much create the transaction and order us to anchor it to the blockchain. And once we've done the anchoring to the blockchain, so the tester says, yes, I do know that this individual is over 18, uh, they send back the credential to the claimer. And that credential is then um, available for the claimer to use and have this attestation um, as a proof uh, via the Kilt blockchain. So when they meet with a, a verifier, someone who wants to validate if they are over 18, uh, they the claimer provides the credential to this individual. Then the verifier does two things. It checks uh, the credential hash, so it makes sure that the information on side of the credential actually uh, combined actually makes the hash of this credential. And then they use that hash to validate uh, through the blockchain to check to see if it is on-chain, right? And if it's on-chain, they make sure, do I trust the individual that had attested this um, credential. If I do, 
then I um, allow this person to come in. So the verifier then says to the claimer, yes, I do know that you're 18, but I do not need to do the validation myself. I just need to check that the individual who attested this um, states it's true. So the individual doesn't have to like go to some centralized service to, to prove this. They have the credential with them, and then they can show it, and only the trust comes from the attester. So yeah. So um, one of these things that um, we, we talked a little, a little bit about was uh, the credential itself, but how does the credential have a, uh, a structure? And maybe, uh, Albert, you can give us a little bit of how a credential gets its structure. Yes. So credentials are basically information. But like, if you want to request information, you somehow also need to convey like, what information do you actually want? You know, you just don't want to get raw, like raw information, like raw data, like some bytes, and then you need to know uh, how, what, what is it, bytes. Um, so there are actually claim types, which give credentials some form of class they belong to. So for example, a driver's license would be one class, an identity card, uh, your identity card would be another thing, uh, or your passport. And um, the claim type provides, you know, a name and a structure and semantics, you know. Um, so here we actually have a schema um, that specifies how the C type itself looks, and then we specify the properties that are inside the claim that are or the credential that are expected to be there, and um, we give it a name and a type. And so, for example, we have age; it could be an integer or a date or whatever you want. Uh, your ID number, which is a string, and the name, which is also a string. And if you have a credential, you can always make sure that it's a credential actually conforms to the C type. And so you know, if I request an uh, ID card, you know, you don't only say, I want to show you, uh, see your ID. I want to see the ID C type from you. And then you can um, choose any of your credentials that actually match with the C type. And anyone can really build a, a C type themselves, right? Yeah, ex exa exactly. The T C types are anchored on chain. So there's an on-chain registry of C types so that nobody, you know, that the C types are not like something private that you keep for yourself. And also, you can choose from already existing C types. You know, so you don't have to create them yourselves, which would actually be a bit harmful because you'd rather want to have like um, C types that are more general and useful for everyone than you know more specific C types that you can only use with one specific yeah. website. And yeah, it gives you like standardization. It for gives the, a standardization yeah. for the credentials exactly. exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you can see here we have a credential hash, and that credential hash is then used to be uh, to look up this uh, um, this object here. And so you can query this on chain as long as you know the block number and the the C type hash. So we actually use the remarks uh, to uh, basically add this in the history, uh, but we don't actually store it uh, in the um, state database. So yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe um, a little bit, once we have the structure of what a C, uh, C type looks like and how it's defined, what we try to do is um, we originally just had private credentials. So the individual who has a, an identity, they have their own private credential. But recently, um, we've come up with the idea of uh, uh, we've started using public credentials. Um, maybe a little bit about why you might have a private credential versus a public credential? Yeah, I mean, private credentials are quite obvious, I would say. <laughs> I mean, nobody really wants to put all their data online, right? So um, the blockchain- And GDR compliance. And also GDR compliance forces uh, you, know, you or um, services to actually be able to delete stuff. Once something personal, like personal data is on a, web, uh, on a blockchain, uh, it's tough to actually delete it again, <laughs> <laughs> um, or it's actually impossible. Um, so that's why you rather want to have your um, private data off the chain. And so they are only anchored uh, on the blockchain by a hash, but um, you, all the data is private to you. You store them privately in your wallet. Yeah. Um, but there are also use cases where actually, you know, they they have to be on chain. For example, for an NFT or something that is automatically triggered um, from a smart contract. You know, they want to write the claim somewhere, um, and it has to be available for everyone to see. 
and then you know it doesn't make sense to store it somewhere off chain. You know, yeah. the, the, also those things might be also used by other blockchains. Again, you know, they read uh, smart contracts, want to read our chain, use this, those credentials to um, have other use cases, and those things have to be on chain. So yeah. there you would use a public credential and actually you know write the content of the credential also on chain yeah. since it's also not really you know personal data in that and case. And that, that's what the divides the two. So the private credential itself uh, is on the clients uh, um, with the client. And the only thing that's actually stored on chain from this object on the left hand side is the root hash. And that's the only thing that's stored. Uh, this is the bottom, 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 right at the bottom. There, pointing, yes. Uh, this is stored on chain. So the individ individual knows that none of their private information is going to be there. But uh, this whole object here on the right uh, is then stored on chain, and you know which block number, uh, which ID it's. And then we would talk a little bit more about the uh, asset DID uh, as a subject, and I think go uh, a bit more into that as well. So maybe uh, just some information about what a digital asset is. Um, a lot of people, uh, it's just what we consider a digital asset is an object. Uh, these are basically entities that are not capable of signing for themselves. So. They can hold. They do not have the capability of holding some cryptographic material, such as a key, and then using that key in order to sign uh, to do some sort of interaction on chain. Um, so yeah. So basically, what we did was created our own specification that um, conforms to the DID um, standard and the chain um, agnostic improvement proposal, which is the CAIP. Um, a little bit down here. Um, I think it's a very um, cool thing that we've done here. And you can find the specification at the bottom. So I can share this um, down here. And so this asset can actually be anything that can be identified and any chain, so across any chain that you can identify it with. It's, a, it's pretty cool because you know a digital asset can be many things. It can be an IoT device. It can be an NFT. It can just be a pure token or some in-game item. So realistically, um, it's anything that can be a unique identifier. and so. Um, once you find the specification, you can kind of um, understand how it works. So what we have here is a, uh, basically a prefix, uh, which is just a, a yeah. Yeah, maybe, the, maybe you want to talk about it. Yeah, the prefix is basically coming from the DID. So uh, you saw DID dot killed. You know, then you know it's a killed method specification. So you, uh, yeah. you know you want to resolve it in a killed way. <laughs> and here we have the prefix prefix asset. So there is a um, DID method specification for. Asset. Yes. Um, so then you would uh, look at the method specification for that, and you know how to use the rest of this. Yes. And yeah. So you, so once you have this, you then have the a did asset, and you have the prefix, and then afterwards you have like basically the chain I uh, ID. So uh, this is on the uh, Ethereum, and then afterwards you have the namespace of what the asset is for this. It's for this uh, ID here. I'm displaying an NFT, um, and then here you have the smart contract it's being used for. So and then afterwards we have the uh, asset reference, so basically to the smart contract itself and the ID of the NFT. So again, this is just kind of like a generic way to identify an asset, and it could realistically be anything that can be uh, considered unique. So, um, but as long as they're basically passive, essentially. Um, so here, um, maybe just go a little bit about this. So this is the NFT that I um, I've just identified. So you can see at the bottom is the same. So again. This is just a testing a digital asset. Um, the the attestation process can basically be very similar on a high level from both of them. Uh, but yeah, a, as you can see, um, this is just an example use case. But the NFT itself could have been displayed in some expedition. Uh, no expedition. Ex. I, I can't say it right now. My tongue tied. Um, it's been displayed in a. Um, a place in Berlin, right? And so that might be um, unique for someone or interesting for someone so that they might see more value generated there and that you know it's actually been in a public gallery and so people can go see it and then um, enjoy its uh, artistic beauty. Uh, but yeah, maybe, um, Albi, can you tell us a little bit about the attestation, uh, the differences, or if there is any? For Between public and? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, um there, there's a little bit of a difference in a workflow, right? Uh, normally, we only have, have the claimer that holds also his um, the credential. The credential is about himself. So the holder of the credential and the um, subject of the credential are the same, actually. While uh, in an asset use case, um, the asset is a subject. You know, you have a credential about the subject, 
and uh, the credential um, is owned by someone else. Um, in this case, um, the um, yeah, NFT owner. Yes. And, and it basically allows any individual to attest to a specific uh, asset. So there's no restrictions in there. So anyone can make an, uh, a credential based upon uh, this specific asset, uh, depending on what C-type they use and how they uh, formulate the, the, the credential itself. So again, uh, having a public credential allows a little bit more flexibility because uh, some assets or some entities actually cannot make a uh, claim about themselves. So that's why we had this uh, uh, need for public credentials and so forth. But yeah, um, I guess. Right now, this is a bit of a showcase, uh, a little bit about what we can do or how we can build like an attestation service. So this is just a little Zub Zero uh, end finisher, but I can move over to the um, this credential app. Uh, maybe where was I? Okay. So um, this is one of our partners' application, and what they have here is just a, a attestation workflow. So uh, I won't. Pretty much, uh, this is a role uh, as an attester. So that's the one who can make an attestation about some individual, right, or something. Um, so realistically, um, what we can do is uh, we can create a C-type. So here, I'm going to make this C-type. Um, again, it could be about a specific NFT. NFT uh, is amazing, right? Uh, you can get a description. This is just pure metadata at this point, right? So what could it be about? Uh, um, yeah, this NFT is amazing. That's not how you spell amazing, but I'm getting there. I can't I can spell. Um, so basically, this uh, process here is just me creating my own um, C type, right? So the C type is the claim structure that we talked about previously. Um, so again, um, I can give it any sort of data uh, name. So this is just a field entry uh, for the object itself. So I can say, um, Amazing. I don't know. Uh, what can we uh, name it? Take amazing. Amazing is good. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Take amazing. Amazing uh, again, make it a boolean, I would say, right? Yeah, this is definitely a boolean. Yeah. So you, you can, uh, on this property here. Or maybe here, an integer, like, you know, how amazing is it actually? Ah, yeah, yeah. That could be also like a scaling slide or something like that. So, but I, I'll leave it as a boolean, um, so like that. Um, yeah. And so ba basically, I'm just creating a C type. You can use this service uh, as like an individual to create this uh, NFT. Maybe I should have, yeah. Oh, I should probably showcase a little bit more. Yeah, what we do right now is um, we submit the C type to the blockchain. So you see it's in broadcasting state, so the transaction is uh, broadcasted to the collator nodes, and the collator nodes will then um, put it in block. Perfect timing, now it's in block. Yes. <laughs> And uh, next is a finalization that we receive from the relay chain. So this always takes a while. So I'm not sure if we want to wait. Um, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. there we go. Yeah. It's finished. Yes. Uh, so yeah. So maybe uh, this platform itself is basically um, like here. Now I have created this individual uh, NFT, uh, which is amazing. Um, and then I, I, this here is the C type hash, which is the thing that's stored on chain, right? So this is uh, basically having the structure that's on chain allows us to then uh, copy it and use it in, in, in for a claimer. So, yeah. So, what does a, dame, a claimer do now? So this yes. is. Yeah. So this was a tester's view, and now we head over to the claimer side of things. So if I have an NFT and I want to actually see that it, or show people that it's amazing. Yes. I. Uh, yeah. What log in log in as yeah. a claimer. So yeah, uh, basically, I'm just going to quickly create an account. Oh, let's keep this as simple as possible. Uh, make sure it's correct. Mm -hmm. Password, password, password. Yep. Yeah, okay. Oh no. Right. Uh, I'll take oh, my yeah. phone and take Don't a photo. Don't take a photo here. from that. Yes, it's, please. It's secret data. Oh my god. Yeah. We know all this process before. Sorry. So yeah, uh, so basically I'm just generating a mnemonic, um, and then from here I'm going to create my uh, account as the individual claimer. So basically allowing me to have uh, an NFT that maybe I, I want to have a credential based upon, and from here I can just do some typing to basically generate it. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, oh. This hazard. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, no, I won't save it. So yeah, 
So uh, now as the side of the claimer, I want to basically take this C type hash that I had previously. So I'm going to take this. And I want to then just import this. So as imagine, uh, as an individual, maybe you have like an attestation service that you want to basically attest some attributes about something. And as a claimer, you basically want to have these attributes attested about you or about a specific um, digital asset, right? So in this circumstance, this is the NFT is amazing. Um, I could, I should have put, okay, yeah. And then basically this allows me to create this claim, right? So in this workflow, you would be the claimer in that side of things, and then you can just sort of say yes or no. Again, it's a Boolean, so I could say no, the NFT was not amazing, or I could say yes, it was, so yeah. So I can then submit this to the attester. So what you do now is, uh, as a claimer, you request an attestation from an attester. Yes. This, is in the background, gets now sent to the attester. Yeah. And let's see if the tester agrees if the NFT yeah. is amazing or not. Yeah, so basically what we did is we generated a DRD in the background, and that DRD then has like the, the keys available for it, so yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the individual then gets a, a message sent from the claimer to the tester. Oh, 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 got it. Yeah, sorry, it's hard on my neck. And you see, oh. Did it receive it? No. Let me refresh. Oh, I think I logged myself out. Oh, God, no. I know what's happening. Now I've logged myself out of this one. Oh, God damn it. I know what I've done. All right. Refuse the product? Yes. Oh, my God. I've, I've messed this up. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's a mnemonic store? No, it's a different mnemonic. That may have taken a photo of earlier. Oh, da, da, da. I should open the second window. I apologize. OK, I'll generate a new one and try to do this again. Oh, I've messed this up. Actually, do you might get locked off from the other one? I know. I am going to get locked off of the other one. Sorry. Oh, God. What? Yeah, I, I guess uh, I accidentally locked myself off, and I don't remember the mnemonic for the attester. I had deleted it, so um, I would have to go through it again. But yeah, um, pretty much uh, you can use this to have like a, essentially like an attestation service, and you can then be attested on the other side. So. And maybe as a dry run, what would have happened is we would see the message popping up at the tester side, and yeah. um, then you could, like, you have a little view, you know, where you see, oh, is it amazing? Yes. Uh, maybe, yes, I approve, or do I deny? Yeah. Um, we obviously approve because we are nice, and the NFT is obviously amazing. Yeah. And then the message gets sent back to the claimer platform where the claimer can then create this credential and yeah. Um, yeah, use it wherever he wants. Yeah. Okay. I apologize. Uh, I messed up a little bit. So, yeah. Uh, maybe any questions at all about the workflow or about the process? Yeah. Yep. Hey guys. Well, thank you first of all for the presentation. I have a very uh, concrete use case. So, um, we're actually doing video on blockchain soon, soon to come, hopefully, to Polkadot. And one of the many things we uh, um, we need from the ecosystem is the ability to. Um, Generate access it. control, access to video. So what I mean, this what you guys represented is pretty, I, I think, a, a good fit in principle. I think NFT gated access is a common one. But my question is, if I am a yoga studio and I don't necessarily have NFTs and I don't like NFTs and I want to create um, a, a video library for my community, my subscribers, yes. could I come on and make my own sort of not NFT based attestation system? Yes, um, you could. That's yeah. th and that, can that be online? Like, I don't want to, every time somebody wants to watch a video, have to come online and accept. Like, some, uh, some sort of a automatic online sort of community at the station. Yes. Uh, so, again, this is uh, not part of the public credentials part of things, but this is more of a private credential that you can issue. It's like, a, essentially, a membership pass, right? So, uh, an individual pays for some service, right? That service says that you can join the yoga video thing. They pay one-time use, and then they receive a 
a credential based on their DID. And then when they come back to the website, they just need to show this credential and then have this as a access control. Yeah. Actually, if you want to do it like that, yeah. And a two quick follow up. So then on, um, and then does this work over uh, XCM or in a, in a parachain in general, or is it just an API of kind of go up to the app and back to the thing? Uh, yeah, so maybe you want to jump yeah, on that one? It could work in an XCA, XCM kind of way. Um, uh, we have something coming up next year, I think, in the beginning of next year, where we um, basically have something for exactly for this use case that you can uh, check credentials on the kill blockchain and then do stuff on another blockchain, for example. But you can also just uh, read the state from the kill blockchain, maybe with a light client um, or some other kind from your blockchain. Depending on the use case, I didn't 100% get. Yeah, I mean, I think in the end, what we're looking at is just have an on on chain system that attests um, a certain membership or cert certain um, uh, sort of rights, and then be able to. And then, is it common to? I mean, in our case, for example, we require we encrypt we encrypt the content into a key space of the use end user. Do say that again. Is it, is it a common use case to actually, with the identity, also be able to retrieve a public key or something that can encrypt for that user specifically? Oh yeah, that's that's a very. I think like one of the core use cases also with DIDs. You can um, like DIDs also have an encryption key, yes. um, which you can like you resolve the DID, you get the encryption key, and then you can encrypt something that is only readable by the specific DID. So if you want to send something, it's. My use case was every, always messaging, <laughs> but uh, if you want to send a video or something, like a video platform thing, that would also totally work, yeah. Way yeah. cool, thank you. So like this, basically I'm just going to here to resolve, oh, I can't spell right now, uh, cancellor. Yeah, so you can see here, um, this is my cancellor, what I presented previously, and uh, what I'm doing is I'm just resolving it in the, uh, here. And you can see now that I'm generating, or I'm querying my DID document on chain. And you can see there's like a, a variety of keys that are here. So the, this key agreement is basically the agreement to have like a conversation, so basically. In, in yeah, it's like, uh, you, this key can be used to derive an encryption key because you can like uh, derive one uh, encryption key per channel, like one specifically for you and the DID. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I, I think the question was like, is there a specific encryption, encryption types that we use? Uh, yeah. So. Um, right now it's uh, ED25549, SR25549, so the standard Maybe things on. Not um, so fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Any? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so yeah, just to, as far as XM goes. So. Uh, so could you support a use case like, for example, on Moonbeam, you have like, you know, I have, uh, I'm, in, I'm in finance, I have a bunch of customers in the US, they want to use DEXs, but they're unsure if, you know, they, they, they need to be OFAC compliant. So I could create a DEX on Moonbeam where all participants that are going to either LP or transact on it have to first uh, present a claim that's verified that they are in fact OFAC compliant. And that would, from Moonbeam, we could do an XCM call to uh, Kilt to verify that claim before the transaction can go through? Yeah, so I think that's uh, something that um, Albie just alluded to. That's something that we're working on at the moment. And it should be uh, more into the Q1 sort of time. I, I, well, I shouldn't give a concrete time. Just a, a more of a thing that we're definitely looking at like uh, happening in the, the near future. And I think it's something that uh, we we're definitely working on uh, or thinking about in a, a serious manner. So yeah, that would be super cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, to give some more information, this is basically the next big thing that we will present. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So stay tuned. Yeah. Um, any other questions? 